event, I should mention, is being held in conjunction with our reading group summit. We're about 60 students from SMU, Baylor, Texas Tech, and the University of Central Arkansas who are in the room today. Uh, these students meet uh, weekly to read and discuss uh, various readings, books, articles, including those by our, our speaker tonight. And they are going to continue uh, through the evening tonight to talk about these ideas over a dinner. And then tomorrow, uh, during the day, they'll meet again and uh, interact with Dr. Williams um, during a, a program just for the students. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our, our very generous sponsor, the McLean Company, for the reading group support, also the Armand Trout Foundation, as well as uh, Tucker Gridwell and Kathy Crow and really all of our donors who help make all of these programs possible. You know, I met uh, our speaker for the first time in Cancun. He doesn't remember this. Um, I think it was 1993 or 4 in Cancun at a Mount Pelerin Society meeting. I was maybe 24 or 5 years old. And uh, uh, Walter was on the beach skipping a session. And I guess I'm now admitting that I was on the beach skipping a session. And, and he looked over at me and he said, Lawson, you better put some sunscreen on because when I got here an hour ago, I looked just like you. Uh, the most important part of that was that he knew my name, which I thought was amazing at the time. Um, Walter needs very little introduction, but let me give it anyway. Uh, born in Philadelphia, uh, Dr. Williams holds a BA in economics from Cal State University of Los Angeles, MA and PhD in economics from UCLA. He served on the faculty of George Mason University in Fairfax and is the George, uh, excuse me, the John M. Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics, and he's been there since 1980. Williams, uh, Dr. Williams is the author of over 150 scholarly journal articles. He's made scores of radio and television interviews and appearances on uh, programs like Nightline, Firing Line, uh, Face the Nation, Milton Friedman's Free to Choose, Crossfire, McNeil Lair, and of course he's the uh, regular uh, substitute, or has been the regular substitute for Rush Limbaugh when Rush is on vacation. <coughs> he also writes a syndicated column, as many of you know, for uh, over 100 newspapers in the United States. The plan for Dr. Williams tonight is to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for about 15 minutes of Q&A. Please join me in providing a warm SMU welcome to Walter Williams. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome, and it's indeed a, a pleasure to uh, be with you tonight. The, the title of my uh, talk is uh, The Legitimate Role of Government in a Free Society. Now, in the course of my uh, comments, I'm going to say things that will break with conventional wisdom on a whole range of topics. I'm going to say things that may be interpreted as mean-spirited, uh, insensitive, uh, uncaring, politically incorrect, uh, to the extent that any of these things you feel any of the th these uh, comments are true, you should feel free to raise any kind of question during the uh, question and answer uh, part. Uh, you need not give me any undue courtesy because I'm your guest. Raise hard questions and don't worry about insulting me. I am uninsultable. <laughs> <coughs> the only way you could possibly insult me is to suggest that I wasn't pretty good in basketball. <laughs> and, and that's a matter of ethnic pride that I take seriously. <laughs> <coughs> now, uh, one of the justifications or primary justification for the growth of government far beyond that envisioned by the founders of our nation was to promote justice and fairness. Well, that might be a worthy goal, but we might also ask, what is justice and fairness? What is the legitimate role of government in a free society? Let me just spend a few minutes talking about what the founders of our nation saw as the legitimate role of government. And let's turn to the rule book that they gave us, namely 
the United States Constitution. And let me just briefly quote sections thereof. Um, <clears throat> most of what the federal government should be doing or is authorized to do is found in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. And let me just brief, briefly mention some sections thereof. First, it says that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, imposts and excises, to pay, the federal, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense of the nation. Congress is also authorized to coin money, to establish post office and post roads, to provide armies. Now, the founders gave Congress taxing and spending authority for these and a few other activities. Namely, Congress is authorized to do these activities and 21 others. Now, nowhere in our Constitution do we find authority for Congress to tax and spend for up to what three quarters of what Congress spends for today. That is, there's no constitutional authority for farm subsidies, bank bailouts, uh, food stamps, welfare, not to mention midnight basket. I think that we can safely say that we've made a significant departure from the constitutional principles of individual freedom and limited government that made us a rich nation in the first place. That is, these principles of freedom were embodied in our country through the combined institutions of private property and limited government. Through numerous successful attacks, private property and limited government are, and I'm having trouble saying this a little bit, are a skeleton of what the founders envisioned. As a matter of fact, Jefferson anticipated this when he said the the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. And the best way of looking at the process of government gaining ground and liberty yielding is to ask what has happened to taxation and spending. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way to look at taxes. Taxes represent government claims on private property. And indeed, if government were to tax private property at 100%, it would confiscate private property, and indeed, taxes are going up. An even better measure of what government is doing to our liberty is look at government spending. And to put it in perspective, because a lot of people don't appreciate this, in 1902, expenditures at all levels of government totaled $1.7 billion. The average taxpayer in 1902 paid $60 in federal, state, and local taxes. In fact, from 1787 until 1925, federal expenditures were just 3% of the GDP except during wartime. Today, federal expenditures alone are close to 25% of the GDP, namely $4 trillion. State and local governments spend over $3 billion, $3 trillion. The average taxpayer today pays $10,000 a year in federal, state, and local taxes. Now the significance of this, ladies and gentlemen, is that as time goes by, we own less and less of our most valuable property, namely ourselves and the fruits of our labor. Another way of looking at this 
is that the average taxpayer works from January 1st until the 1st of May to pay federal, state, and local taxes. So that means we're going on five months out of the year where we do not have rights to decide how the fruits of our labor will be used. Somebody else makes that decision. And keep in mind, a working definition of slavery is that you work 12 months out of the year and it, it is someone else that decides how the fruits of your labor will be used. Now, in the economic arena, the founders thought that relatively free markets, or what is called capitalism, was the most successful or the most effective means for the promotion of individual freedom. Indeed, capitalism is defined as a system wherein individuals are free to pursue their own interests so long as they do not violate the rights of others. There is voluntary exchange. There are private property rights held in goods and services. And much of the original intent of the United States Constitution, as seen by the document itself, and the Federalist Papers and other papers that debated the Constitution in the uh, 1780s, was to bring about a climate in which this kind of social organization could occur. The great benefit of the free enterprise system is that through private ownership and control, it minimizes the capacity of one person to coerce another person. Additionally, the coercive powers of the government are minimized and restricted to the legitimate functions of government in a free society. And what are the legitimate functions of government in a free society? Well, one legitimate function of government is to protect you and me from international thugs violating our private property rights. So that says that one legitimate function of government is to provide for national defense. Another legitimate function of government is to protect you and me from domestic thugs violating our private property rights. And so that says that at some level, there should be the provision of police services. Other legitimate functions of government in a free society are those of enforcing constitutional order, the adjudication of disputes, and the provision of certain public goods, public goods as an economist would define them. That is goods that benefit all Americans as opposed to specific Americans. To pay for these legitimate and constitutionally mandated functions of government, we're each obliged to pay our share. Now, some people, <coughs> particularly legal scholars in the audience, might argue, well, this guy Williams has a very, very narrow interpretation of the Constitution, Constitution because the Constitution is a living document. Well, anyone who says that the Constitution is a living document is also saying that we don't have a Constitution because the Constitution represents the rules of the game and for the rules of the game to mean anything and to be, uh, to be effective, they must be fixed. Or another way of looking at it, how many of you would like to play me poker tonight and the rules be living? <laughs> <coughs> Maybe under certain circumstances, my two pair could beat your three of a kind or full house. Now, the founders in their great wisdom they recognized that we might have to change the rules of the game, so they gave us Article 5 as a way to amend the United States Constitution. But most changes in the rules of the game have happened in the Supreme Court, or have happened by presidents just ignoring the Constitution of the United States, and Congress ignoring the, the uh, Constitution of the United States. Now, for the past half century 
or maybe a little bit more, free enterprise and what it implies has been under unrelenting attack. Americans from all walks of life, whether they realize it or not, have demonstrated a deep and abiding contempt for private property and individual liberty. From free, enter free enterprise is threatened today, somewhat ironically, not because of its failure. It's threatened because of its success. That is, free enterprise, or what some people call capitalism, has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of mankind, such as pestilence, disease, gross hunger and poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once inexcusable and unbearable. Un and unbearable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate these so-called unbearable and inexcusable problems has led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our prosperous nation, prosperous nation was built. In the name of other ideals, such as race and sex balance, energy conservation, affordable housing, medical care, energy, con energy uh, conservation, and, and, and uh, <coughs> having difficulty seeing some of this, and, uh, and consumer protection, we have abandoned many personal liberties. As a result of widespread control by government to achieve these so-called higher objectives, we are increasingly subordinated to the point where considerations of personal liberty are seen as secondary or tertiary matters. That is, personal liberty in our nation is increasingly treated as dirt. Now you might say, well, isn't this guy exaggerating a little bit? Let me ask you a question. Suppose I write a letter to the United States Congress and I tell them my name is Walter Williams, I am an emancipated adult, I'm fully capable of taking care of my own retirement needs. If I fail to do so, let me beg or go die, die in the streets but stop taking money out of my paycheck for Social Security. How do you think that would be greeted? It would be greeted with contempt. Here are some people telling you and me how much we should put aside out of each week's pay for retirement. How would you feel if they told you how much to take out of each week's pay for food, for entertainment, for your children's education? And if you didn't obey them, you would go to jail. You would view that as totalitarianism. Now, the ultimate end to this process, ladies and gentlemen, is totalitarianism and tyranny. Now, I am not saying that we are a totalitarian nation yet. But if you ask the question, which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more personal liberty or are we headed towards more government control over our lives? It would have to unambiguously be the latter. And remember, if you take tiny steps towards any goal, sooner or later you're going to reach it. Or as the great philosopher David Hume said, it is seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. Or maybe a better way of putting it, it was uh, my late colleague, Leonard Reed, the founder of the Foundation of Economic Education. He explained it in another way that's very interesting. He said that if you wanted to take liberty away from Americans, you had to know how to cook a frog. And Leonard Reed said, you cannot cook a frog by putting on a pot of boiling water and then throwing the frog in the water. Because the frog's reflexes are so quick that as soon as his feet touched the boiling water, he would hop away and be free. Leonard Reed said, 
the way to cook a frog is to put on a pot of cold water, put the frog in the water, and heat it up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. Well, that's the same thing with Americans. If anybody came over here talking about taking away all of our liberties all at once, we would righteously rebel. But they can talk about taking away our liberties bit by bit. Now, the primary justification for the attack on private property, economic freedom, and privacy can be found in people's desire for government to do good. We all say things like, government should help the needy, government should help the elderly, government should help failing businesses, government should help college students, government should help other deserving segments of our society. Well, it's all well and good to say that, but we have to realize that government has no resources of its very own. What I mean by that, ladies and gentlemen, those programs coming out of Washington or your state capital, they don't represent congressmen reaching into their own pockets or legislators reaching in their own pockets and sending the money out. Moreover, there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus that gives them money. So when you recognize that government has no resources of its very own, it forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to, through coercion, threats, and intimidation, confiscate that dollar from some other American. Now, if you think I'm being too loose with that terminology, intimidation, threats, and coercion, well, you have April 15th to check me out next year. <laughs> you can tell the agents of the United States Congress, I will pay for my share of the constitutionally mandated functions of the federal government, but I will not pay for those things that are not authorized by the United States Constitution. You will see all the intimidation, threats, and coercion that you want to see. And if you act too ugly, you'll get shot. Now, government does those things, we ask government to do those things, that if a private person did the identical thing we would roundly condemn him as an ordinary despicable thief. For example, suppose I see an elderly lady sleeping on a grate in a dead of winter in downtown Dallas. She's hungry, she's cold, she needs some medical attention. And suppose I walk up to Professor Lawson with a gun in my hand and I say, give me your $200. And having gotten his $200, I go downtown and buy the lady some medical attention, some food and shelter. Would you find me guilty of a crime? I'd be guilty of a crime, I'd be guilty of theft. And how is theft defined? Theft is defined as taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. And most Americans would agree with me. But suppose <coughs> instead of my taking uh, uh, Professor Lawson's money and helping the lady out, suppose the, the agents from the IRS, they say to me, Williams, you know that $200 you made last week, <coughs> that you planned to buy a nice bottle of Lafitte Rothschild Bordeaux wine with me? You will not do that, you'll give it to us, and we will go downtown and help the lady out. Is there any distinction between those two acts? I assert there is no distinction whatsoever. And if you press me for a distinction, I can only find one. The first act where I walked up to Bob, that is illegal theft. The second act is legalized theft. Both acts involve taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. <coughs> now, let me just make a note in passing here, is that 
I personally believe in helping one's fellow man in need. And I do a lot of it. But I believe that reaching into one's own pockets to help one's fellow man in need is praiseworthy and laudable. Reaching into somebody, somebody else's pockets to help one's fellow man in need is worthy of condemnation. And for the Christians among us, <clears throat> when God gave Moses the commandment, thou shalt not steal, he did not mean thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in the United States Congress. <laughs> <coughs> now, in a free society, we want all, if not most, of our relationships to be voluntary, peaceable and voluntary. And we want to minimize involuntary exchange. Let me, let me uh, look at it another way, because voluntary and involuntary might not uh, relate to a lot of people. And I always tell people, I always equate I, I always equate voluntary exchange with seduction, and I love seduction. <laughs> and let me explain, because there's a lot of young people here, and the hormones are in uproar. <laughs> let me explain what seduction is, the essence of seduction. Seduction occurs when you proposition your fellow man, if you make me feel good, I'll make you feel good. An example of that is when I walk, walk into my grocer's. And I proposition him. I say, if you make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk. I'll make you feel good, give you $3. Both the, the grocer and I are better off. That is, the grocer is better off because he valued the $3 more than the milk. And I'm better off because I valued the milk more than the $3. And for those of you who remain your, rem remember your game theory, we call that a positive sum game. Now, involuntary exchange is like rape. And what's the essence of rape? Rape is when you proposition your fellow man in the following way. If you don't make me feel good, I'm going to make you feel bad. An example of that would be where I walked into the grocer with a gun in my hand. And I tell him, if you don't make me feel good, give me the gallon of milk. I'll make you feel bad, blow your brains out. Clearly, I'm better off, but the grocer is worse off. And we call that a zero-sum game. And you might note in passing that most zero-sum games in our society are the games that we play with government. That is, if we don't make them feel good, they're going to make us feel bad. Now, a lot of people say, well, Williams, you know, these things that you protest against, you have to keep in mind that we are a democracy and majority rules. Well, when a person says that to me, I say, well, I try to explain, well, first, the founders did not mean for us to be a democracy. They had utter contempt for the idea of, of democracy. They meant for us to be a republic. Uh, and I also ask people, do, do we pledge allegiance to the a flag for the democracy for which it stands? Or that song during the War of 1861, is it the battle hymn of the democracy? Probably the republic. But I tell them, <coughs> but more importantly than those issues, I remind people that, that a majority consens consensus does not establish morality. <coughs> now, some people will say, well, we need a powerful government to offset the power of big business. Well, if you look at it, what kind of power does big business have? That is, what kind of power to take money from me does big business have? You know, like uh, firms like IBM, uh, Chrysler, General Motors, uh, Exxon. In other words, what's necessary for Exxon to get a dollar out of me? Well, first, I must voluntarily get up out of my chair and get into my car and voluntarily drive up this man's lot and voluntarily hand him some money for some gasoline. Where's the coercion? He has no power over me. 
But that does not describe our relationship with government. They can get dollars from us whether we want to give it to them or not. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say that businesses can get dollars from us whether we want to give it to them or not. But what do they have to do first? They have to go to the United States Congress and get permission to rip us off. Um, take Chrysler when it was having its difficulty. Or, or take the farmers. Now, the, the farmers, they know where I live. I live in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And if the farmers are having trouble, they can come knock on my door and say, buddy, can you spare a dime? I'd probably tell the farmers to go play in the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so they know that. And so what they'll do, they'll go to their congressman or senator, and they'll say to him, <clears throat> in effect, if we, ask Williams, if we ask Williams to voluntarily help us out, he's going to tell us to go play in the traffic. So can you use, <clears throat> I'm sorry, can you use your agents at the IRS to take his money? That's how business can get dollars from us. Whether we want to give it to them or not, they must get permission from our elected representatives. Now, the free market and voluntary exchange are roundly denounced by the defenders of the new, what I call the new human rights. These defenders of the new human rights, they are supporters of reduced private property, reduced rights to profits, they're anti-competition and pro-monopoly. These are people who are pro-control and coercion by the government. These are people who believe that they are far more intelligent and have greater wisdom than the masses and that they have been ordained to forcibly impose that wisdom on the rest of us. Now, they do this in the name of good. But I have, to, I have to tell you that every tyrant that have, has ever existed does things in the name of good. Now, their plan requires the attenuation or the elimination of the free market. Why do tyrants want to eliminate the free market? Well, the free market implies voluntary transactions. And tyrants do not trust that people behaving voluntarily will do what the tyrant thinks they ought to do. So they want to replace the market with economic planning, or some people call it industrial planning. I'll give you a definition of industrial planning or economic planning that will last you the rest of your lives. Economic planning is nothing more than the forcible superseding of somebody else's plan by the powerful elite. Let me give you some examples of that. My daughter might plan to work for the hardware store guy down the street for $4 an hour. He says it's OK. She says it's OK. Her mother says it's OK. And her father says it's OK. But the powerful elite will say, we're not going to allow that transaction to occur because it's not being transacted at the prices we think it ought to be transacted at, namely $7.25 an hour. Or I might plan to buy a motorcycle, a Honda motorcycle from a Japanese producer. The powerful elite will say, we're going to supersede your plan through tariffs and quotas because we think you ought to buy a Harley Davidson, a made in America Harley Davidson. Now, of course, these people do this in the name of good. But do-gooders don't realize that most good in the world is not done in the name of good. In other words, if you were to ask me, Williams, what's that human motivation that gets the most wonderful things done? I would say greed. That is, I'm not talking about ripping off people, uh, cheating, misrepresentation. I'm talking about people trying to get as much as they can for themselves. Now, for example, you might not have looked at it this way. For example, you, you're going to have this winter, or you had last winter, Texas cattle ranchers 
getting up in blizzards in the dead of night, trying to run down stray cows to feed them, uh, sometimes getting kicked by the cows, making this huge personal sacrifice to ensure that New Yorkers have beef on their shelves. You'll have uh, Idaho potato farmers getting up in the morning doing back-breaking work, bugs biting them, dirt underneath their fingernails, sun beating down on them, making this personal sacrifice to ensure that New Yorkers also have potatoes on their shelves. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you think they're doing that because they love New Yorkers? <laughs> they may hate New Yorkers. I'm not that wild about New Yorkers myself. <laughs> but they make sure that beef and potatoes gets New York every single day. Why? Because they want more for themselves. This was Adam Smith, uh, who, who was the, uh, wrote the, uh, the Wealth of Nations in 1776. He said, the public good is promoted best by the private interest. Now, I'll ask you another question about New Yorkers now. How much beef and potatoes do you think, think New Yorkers would have if it all depended on human love and kindness? <laughs> I'd be worried about New Yorkers. <laughs> now, you know, some people say, well, Williams, you know, since you're trying to win friends and influence people, instead of saying greed, why don't you say enlightened self-interest? Well, that's okay, but I like greed better. <laughs> yeah. Let me give you another example of enlightened self-interest. I've often told people that I don't care anything about future generations. And sometimes people are shocked. And so they say, why don't you care about future generations, William? Well, I ask, well, what have future generations ever done for me? I mean, some kid that's going to be born in 2050, what has he done for me? And if he has not done anything for, for me, how then am I obliged to do anything for him? Where's the quid pro quo? But if you watch my actual behavior, my behavior would belie that sentiment. Uh, a few years ago, I took $400 that I could have consumed selfishly by buying two nice bottles of Chateau de Chem soft drink wine. <laughs> but instead of doing that, I planted seedlings around my property. Now, when those trees reach their full maturity, there'll be some 20, 50 kids swinging in my trees, eating my apples and my pears. Mrs. Williams, uh, uh, she made extensive improvements to our house with my money, by the way. <laughs> um, built a beautiful sunroom. Now that sunroom is going to outlast both of us. There'll be some 20, 50 kid tracking mud into my sunroom. <laughs> now I ask the question, why did I make the sacrifice of current consumption to produce something that's going to benefit people beyond my lives that I, I don't even know? Well, the answer is very easy. That is, the nicer my house is, the longer it will provide housing services, what? The higher the price I get when I go to sell the house. That is, by pursuing my own narrow self-interest, self I can't help but make a house available for future generations, whether I mean to or not. And you can ask the question, would I have the same incentives to conserve on the scarce resource of our society if the government had my owned my house? or if there were a 75% transfer tax when I went to sell my house. No. Anything that weakens my private property right in that house weakens my incentive to do the socially responsible thing, namely conserve and protect the scarce resources of our society. Let me just give you one ex other example. You people look nice. I don't know whether you're nice at all. <laughs> but <coughs> some of you could be concerned about the extinction of various species of animals. I, I don't give a hoot. <laughs> and the reason is quite practical, because according to biologists, 94% of, of uh, all living things that have ever lived on Earth, 94% are now extinct. 
And so I said, why get in a tizzy over 94.1 or 0.2? But a lot of people are concerned about this. Uh, they're concerned about the extinction of the bald eagle. I remember I saw my first bald eagle. I think I was 35 years old. I saw the critters in a cage in the zoo. And I was asking myself, could I have gone another 35 years without seeing them? And I concluded, yes. <laughs> but anyway, um, being more, a little more serious, um, I was listening to a program a number of years ago, it was a PBS uh, program, and people were picketing the UN because of the, they were concerned with the possible extinction of the white rhino, uh, the gorilla, uh, uh, kangaroo, and other uh, animals. And so I wrote down the list of animals. I wrote down another list of animals, and, and people are concerned about the whale, you had to even form Save the Whale Clubs, or, or Ducks Unlimited. And so, I wrote down another list of animals that are very valuable to us. And I said, how come people are not marching for the chicken? <laughs> or, or how come they're not mar saying, save the cow clubs? They're not you know, forming save the cow clubs. Well, what's the essential difference between these two lists of animals? Uh, cows, pigs, and sheep, and then the uh, uh, rhinos, elephants, and gorillas. Well, the essential difference is that with this list of animals, cows, pigs, and chickens, they belong to somebody. It's somebody's private property, and therefore it's somebody's interest to make sure they're taken care of. With the other list of animals, they don't belong to anybody. It's nobody's wealth is at stake. So nobody has a private interest in taking care of them. So for those of you who are concerned about the extinction of various species, my recommendation is you should, should try to uh, get them privatized. Let me, let me be begin to close. Um, by the way, de despite the virtues of the free market or capitalism, there's considerable hostility towards it. Some people say it, do it, it doesn't work. Well, maybe one of the reasons it's not allowed to work. I was giving a lecture at one university, and a woman stood up, and she said, the capitalist system is oppressive towards women. And so I asked her, I said, if you are a radical feminist, what country do you want to live in? Saudi Arabia, China. You want to live in the United States, or at least Western Europe, more capitalist society. Or if you are a criminal, where do you want to go to jail? Is it Turkey or Mexico? <laughs> you want to go to jail in the United States so you don't miss your HBO shows in the afternoon. Now, one of the things which is a subject of an entirely uh, new lecture is that with the rise of capitalism became, uh, came better treatment, more humane treatment of people. Why? Because prior to the rise of capitalism, the way people amassed great wealth was through slavery, looting, and plundering. With the rise of capitalism, it made it possible for people to accumulate great wealth by serving their fellow man, by pleasing their fellow man. Why is Bill Gates so wealthy? He served his fellow man, he's pleasing his fellow man. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, the, we saw that with the rise of capitalism came better treatment to minorities, to women, and to other uh, segments of our society that were formerly mistreated. Well, <laughs> Let me begin to close by saying almost every group in our nation feels that the government owes them a special favor. Manufacturers think that government ought to impose tariffs, that is, keep foreign goods out so they can charge you and I, you and me, um, uh, higher prices. Farmers think that government owes them pr uh, subsidies. Labor unions think that government should keep their jobs protected from those who are not members of the labor union. College professors and intellectuals think that government should give them funds to do research. College professors love to get $500,000 grants, do studies on poverty, and have meetings to talk about poor people in a not very nice hotel in Florida in the winter. <laughs> now, if you ever see a group of conservatives 
arguing, you can bring instant peace, instant agreement with them, between them. That is, conservatives rail against food stamps, aid to, aid to dependent uh, children, uh, legal aid, but they come out in support for aid to dependent banks, aid to dependent farmers, and aid to dependent motorcycle companies. Conservatives as well as liberals, Democrats as well as Republicans, prove H.L. Mencken's definition of an election quite correct. And H.L. Mencken, for those of you who have forgotten, he was a political satirist for the Baltimore Sun. And, sometimes, and somebody asked H.L. Mencken to give a definition of an election. And H.L. Mencken replied, government is a broker in pillage. And every election is an advance auction on the sale of, of stolen merchandise. <laughs> to the extent that H.L. Mencken is correct, which I think he was, he was, we've identified our problem. Too many of us want to blame politicians for our problems. But the bulk of the blame lies with you and me. That is, politicians are doing precisely what we elect them to office to do. And what do we elect them to office to do? We elect them to office to use the power of their office to take the property of one American and bring it back to us. Now, some of you might say, well, not we in Texas. We don't do that. Well, imagine I'm running for the Senate in Texas, and I go, and I go across the, the state campaigning, and I tell my fellow Texans, look, I've read the United States Constitution. If you elect me to the Senate, don't expect for me to bring back highway construction funds, aid to higher, higher education, uh, <coughs> a med Medicare uh, uh, and food stamps, and all these other uh, programs. Do you think I would get elected to the Senate from Texas? I don't think so. And the people in Texas would be doing absolutely the correct thing by not electing me to the Senate. And the reason why, if I don't bring back billions and billions of dollars of, of taxpayer money, it doesn't mean that Texans will pay a lower federal income tax. All that it means is that Oklahoma will get it instead. That is, once legalized theft begins, it pays for everybody to participate in it. And those who don't participate in it will wind up holding the brown end of the stick. And for those of you with a rural background, you know what the brown end of the stick looks like. <laughs> now let me uh, uh, say that I think that if the founders came back, they'd be very disappointed with you and me. They would be disappointed that we have sacrificed liberty for safety. But the optimistic note is that we Americans have not done, we don't have a history of doing the wrong thing for a long time. We somehow get our act together. But I'd urge that we better be about getting our act together while we still have the freedom or liberty to do so. Uh, thank you very much and uh, take questions together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've got a microphone here. If anybody has a question, I think the best thing maybe is to come down here and form a small line. Uh, okay. Dennis is going to ask a question, but he's going to speak very loudly. Thank you. Well, one of the statements about the Klan, uh, it was, uh, I was debating somebody, I think, uh, on education and why we need tuition tax credits or, or vouchers or 
some way to introduce competition in the public schools because uh, public schools were a wreck, and particularly for uh, black students. And I said that if I were the grand uh, dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, I could not find a better way to sabotage uh, black academic excellence than the public school system in most of our cities, which is kind of strong statements, but. Um, and the other part of your question? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, Gro uh, Grover Cleveland uh, is one of my favorite uh, presidents. He was one of the presidents who would actually say, and you will not hear a president say it again, he says, there's no constitutional authority for engaging in certain activities, such as sending relief to farmers in Texas. I think that Grover Cleveland is the king of the veto. I think that he vetoed more acts of Congress and more bills of Congress than any other president uh, uh, before him. Uh, <coughs> to to, to have, have some appreciation for where we Americans have come, uh, we all acknowledge that, that James Madison is the father of the United States Constitution. And James Madison ought to know what's in the United States Constitution. And it turned out in 1794, Congress appropriated $15,000 to help some French refugees. <coughs> James Madison stood on the floor of the house irate. And he said, and I'm quoting him, he said, I cannot undertake <coughs> to lay my finger on that article of the Constitution which granted a right to Congress of expending on the objects of benevolence the money of their constituents. Three quarters of the federal budget today is spent on the objects of benevolence. Can you imagine what the American people would do to a politician running for high office who would say the same thing? James Madison also said that charity is not a function of government. Can you imagine what the American people would do to a presidential candidate who said the same thing? That is, we've gone so far in our nation from the founding principles. That is, <coughs> that is we believe, we believe that it is okay for Congress to forcibly use one American to serve the purposes of another. And I think that that's wrong. I think that's immoral. Okay, there's another question. My name is Bob Brewer from Tyler, and my question involves the Constitution and Constitution Week. Two weeks ago, I called five schools in our school district and asked them about Constitution Week. They didn't have a clue. I called our TEA, spoke with the Director of Social Studies Curriculum for the Texas Education Agency, he knew nothing about Constitution Week. I spoke to my representative at the State Board of Education, same response. Five minutes later, I ran into our senator that passed Rick Green's bill through the Texas legislature. And Eventually, it became nationwide. What can we do to make sure our students are studying the Constitution during September 17th, Constitution Week? I'm not quite sure what we can do. Um, the knowledge of the Constitution uh, is, is very weak in our country. There's a recent survey that came out in the last, within the last month that uh, pointed out that only 37% of Americans could identify the three branches of government, the legislative, <laughs> executive, and judicial branches of government which is a sad state of affairs. And I think that, that I'm not a conspiracy person, but I'm, I'm thinking that if you want uh, unlimited government, you don't want to teach people about the Constitution because the essence of the Constitution was to bring about a limited government. I would recommend that you read, <coughs> uh, you know, the Federalist Papers uh, uh, were written by uh, John Jay and uh, Hamilton and Madison. And the Federalist Papers were written uh, trying to convince the citizens of New York to ratify the United States Constitution and, and, and uh, get others to uh, uh, ratify the Constitution because ratification of the Constitution was not just a done deal. It was a very difficult process. 
But in Federalist Paper 45, James Madison is attempting to explain to the citizens of New York and the nation what's in the Constitution. And he said, and I'm virtually quoting him, he said that the powers that we've delegated to the federal government are few and well-defined and restricted mostly to external affairs. Those left with the people and the states are indefinite and numerous. Now, if you turn that upside down, you'd have what we have today. The powers of the federal government are indefinite and numerous, and those of the people and the states are restricted. Ask yourself, what can the people of Texas do without federal permission? Can you decide how many gallons to flush your toilet? <laughs> Little simple things like that. Uh, so, uh, so it pays. It pays people who want bigger and bigger government to get the American people to be ignorant of the Constitution or disrespectful of the Constitution. Or, or look at uh, another issue that's, uh, that's currently uh, uh, debated, and that's the whole issue of Second Amendment rights. And too many Americans believe that the founders gave us a Second Amendment so that we can go deer and duck hunting and, and protect our homes against criminals. But if you read the Constitution, you read the debates, and matter of fact, these are on my website, WalterEWilliams.com, the founders gave us the Second Amendment with the explicit statement to allow us to be able to protect ourselves against government. What government do you think they were talking about? <laughs> they weren't talking about England because the war was over. They were talking about uh, the American government. In case it becomes uh, tyrannical, we'd have some last resort to be able to protect ourselves. Hi, Walter. Thank you for coming here and speaking. Uh, I agree with most of what you say. I really appreciate that, um, you being here. Um, as far as rule of law is concerned, you argue that a constitution that is not fixed has very little value. And I'm wondering, as a fellow Christian, I feel like that's not necessarily true because I believe, at least, that the Bible can be interpreted given today's circumstances. So do you believe that interpreting the Bible um, in the way that people today interpret the Constitution would destroy its authority and leave it undermined? Well, the, I no, I, I said the rules of the game, the uh, rules of the game must be fixed. And the founders gave, away, gave us a way to amend the uh, Constitution, to change it, depending on, on circumstances. They had foresight to say, well, gee, sooner or later we might need to change it. And they gave us Article 5 as a way to change the Constitution. And so any rule of, uh, of conduct, unless it is somehow fixed, uh, it, 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 it's, it doesn't have a lot of effect and it doesn't have a lot of meaning. But we can talk about that uh, some other time. Hi, Mr. Williams. Thank you so much for being here. My question for you is, is there a free market justification for intellectual property laws? Intellectual property rights? Um, that's a debatable issue, and, and there's a strong debate on, uh, on both sides. I think property rights in ideas um, um, <laughs> encourages uh, the development of these ideas that give people incentive. Uh, I think some of the things that we might do with, if you're referring to patents and copyrights, uh, we, we might want to change the time periods and the extent of the, uh, uh, of the patents. But I think that, I think, and I could be wrong about this, is that we do need to provide incentives for people. Mr. Williams, our uh, former esteemed ex-president used to criticize uh, the lack of positive rights uh, enumerated in our constitutional way of um, interpreting the law and such. I um, was wondering, in a free society, do you believe that positive rights, as opposed to the negative rights, actually exist or should exist? Well, uh, what do you mean by positive? Give me an example of positive rights. Positive right would mean I have a right to not be offended. I have a right to be fed. I have a right to health care, et cetera. Well, if a person, <coughs> to answer that question, you have to look at it this way. If a person has a right say to healthcare, 
or right to housing or right to anything that he cannot afford to buy, then for government to give him that right requires that the government take away the right of somebody else to what they produce. That is, if you have a right to something that you did not produce, the only way you can get it is for someone else not to have a right to what they produce. Um, I think so far as um, uh, issues of uh, free speech and freedom of association, the true test of one's commitment to free speech does not come when he allows people to be free to say those things with which he agreed. The true test of one's commitment to free speech comes when he allows people to be to free to say those things that he finds utterly offensive. The same thing with freedom of association. The true test of one's commitment to freedom of association does not come when he allows people to be free to associate in ways that uh, he deems uh, okay. It comes when he allows people to be free to associate in ways that he finds utterly offensive. So to be for freedom, you have to be a, ba uh, you have to be a brave and bold person because you have, to affect, you have to accept the notion that some people are not going to behave some people are not going to engage in those voluntary things that you think are, are right or you, that you think may be wrong. I mean, such as uh, uh, racial discrimination. Uh, I think that people have the right to engage in, uh, in, in racial discrimination so long as they don't use government. I mean, I, I am, I'm guilty of racial discrimination. Uh, back in 1960, when I was choosing a wife to marry, I didn't give every woman an equal opportunity. Uh, I systematically discriminate against Chinese women, Japanese women, Irish women, Italian women, women that were criminal records, women that didn't bathe regularly. And, uh, <coughs> none of my criteria for entering into a contract with Mrs. Williams would have met any of the EEOC criteria. <laughs> and, and as a matter of fact, Mrs. Williams, uh, during our marriage, she required for me to continue to discriminate against other women, <laughs> even though I, once in a while, I thought about equal opportunity. <laughs> and so, <laughs> We're running a little short on time. We're going to take one question here and one question over there, but then we'll have just a couple minutes afterwards if we can privately mill around. Thank you, I'll keep it short. Dr. Williams, I've been a fan for a long time, so it's great to hear you speak. Thank you for coming to Dallas. Thank I you. wanted to talk, um, I, I was hoping you could explain um, what you mean by taxation being theft in a philosophical sense. Is there a difference between good taxation and bad taxation, or do you classify it all as theft? Well, and if not, how do we tell the difference? Well, I, I think that uh, we should, um, you, I think that as, as many of our founders saw that government, uh, Government was a necessary evil. That is, we need some government to protect us against international and domestic thugs violating our private property rights. And the fact that they, uh, they view uh, government as, uh, as, as uh, the essence of government as coercion and possibly evil, they wanted to keep it as small as possible. And so they, that's one of the reasons why they argued for a limited government. And, to, to pay, and I think that uh, taxation is justified to pay for those constitutionally mandated functions of the federal government. That is, we do need some, go some government, and we say, well, how are we going to pay for it? Well, we, we have to engage in taxing. We can't uh, depend on voluntary exchange. Although uh, uh, some of my uh, 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 colleagues who believe in anarchy, they, they would disagree on but I'm right and they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Williams, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, I can't help but think Ayn Rand would be very pleased with what you had to say tonight. Well, uh, given that uh, our government has far exceeded its enumerated powers, do you feel that an Article Five convention is our only answer? And if we had a convention, what exactly would you like to see happen with that? Well, uh, th yeah, the question is, uh, uh, would I, uh, would I like to see an Article 5 
uh, convention. And, and we have that uh, in the Constitution, if you read Article 5, uh, how to amend the United States Constitution. I would be uh, deathly fearful of an Article 5 uh, convention. And the primary reason is that at the convention, we would not have people like Benjamin Franklin and uh, uh, James and, and uh, Matt James Madison and and uh, George Mason. We'd have people like Chuck Schumer and <laughs> Nancy Pelosi and and, uh, and others of that ilk. And, uh, and and we might wind up with fewer freedoms than we have uh, now. Um, now. I, I worked uh, with uh, Milton Friedman and Bob Bork and, and James Buchanan and a bunch of other people back in the late 70s on a spending limitation uh, to the uh, amendment to the United States Constitution. As a matter of fact, that spending limitation uh, passed uh, the uh, Senate in 19, I think 1982, but when it was, in, and it did not make it through the House and in 1986 when we reintroduced got a uh, senator to reintroduce it, didn't even make it through the Senate. And so people started asking, saying that we should call for a constitutional convention with the narrow purpose of amending, uh, putting a spending limitation amendment to the United States con uh, um, Constitution. But many people will argue, well, once you have a convention, you cannot restrict what happens at the convention. You, it will more, it can, turn into a runaway convention. And indeed, our first uh, um, uh, constitutional convention was a runaway convention. It was not, in the, when the convention was formed, it was not intended at all to come up with the Constitution of the United States that we have. Look, folks, thank you very much, and I enjoyed being with you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.